Hi, everyone. So we're going to get started now. We're going to be uh, speaking about emerging tech and the law. So I'll give you some background on myself. I am a business and tech lawyer. I work with entrepreneurs, startups and businesses and help them with negotiating and drafting their contact contracts and tech transactions. And I work with many emerging tech companies among my practice, including companies that deal with AI, IoT, blockchain, things like that, which complicates transactions. So now we're gonna talk about some of those complications that arise with the new emerging tech. So we're gonna focus, for example, on AI today. So some of the issues that arise with AI, there are positives and negatives to how we have to address it. So positives include that there are, you know, increased automation of route and simple tasks that creates more efficiency and speed in our transactions. We replace, uh, we are able to replace human labor uh, for you know, physically intensive or dangerous tasks and that thereby reduce injuries. Uh, we're able to have more precision in medical treatments and procedures so that we can improve public health and just have healthier and longer lives. Uh, similarly, we can have widespread adoption of autonomous vehicles, which will transform uh, you know, the transportation industry, same with the delivery industry, things like that. And additionally, it, it leads to a redefining of our own roles in the workplace and society as these fourth industrial revolution technologies become widely adopted and instituted on a mass basis. However, there are some challenges that come along with the adoption of AI and the tech. Uh, and some of those considerations, there are social and ethical issues, there's economic impacts, there's intellectual property complications, privacy complications, and liability complications that arise from adoption of this new tech. So first we're gonna talk about some of the social and ethical considerations. So particularly one example is use of facial recognition software for identification purposes. Uh, the technology as it currently exists has high error rates with respect to identification of minorities and women. So as a initial matter, it's already creating kind of social ethical considerations there because it's not going to be able to identify certain groups of people accurately. Um, and people are using it, for example, in there have been several instances of, of uh, like kind of beta tests that uh, different companies like Amazon have done with police departments trying to identify, you know, supposedly, uh, you know, criminals and things like that, which is obviously a problem if it's misidentifying people. It's also problematic for those kind of use cases because you have implicit biases built into these type of, uh, you know, programs. So you have the biases of the developers themselves, as well as the implicit biases that are contained in the data that's used to train the AI. Um, and even though that incorporation of that bias may be unintentional, it does exasperate existing biases related to, you know, for example, race and sex and things like that. So that's something we need to be aware of as these technology is adopted and is, is you know, is developed and adopted uh, because if we don't, we have situations where we're having institutional, basically kind of institutionalizing a lot of these social and ethical problems that already exist. So we don't want situations where people are being just characterized on how the facial recognition software is, you know, identifying them as having certain characteristics based on their, just their looks, which is improper or, you know, there's been situations where they have already tried to use facial recognition software to allow people to have access to the buildings they live in. Again, that's problematic when it's misidentifying um, minorities and women, they're being denied the right to have access to where they're living just because of the issues with the technology. And that's a, you know, that's a legal issue uh, as well as a social and ethical issue because now you're violating those people's rights. So that's something we need to consider kind of moving forward. Um, another kind of social ethical consideration is that we have increased kind of usage of autonomous weapons 
and that can lead to a autonomous kind of weapons race. And there's already, country, you know, certain countries like Russia who are actually making a big push to be in ahead of that. So that's something we need to consider too. As we create these autonomous weapons, there's less of a, a you know, a direct kind of relationship to the harm that's being done. So people may not really appreciate and realize that there is consequences to this, you know, weapons race. The other you know, social and ethical consideration that we have right now is the kind of increased spreading of misinformation and that's happening you know through bots and things like that and we're having situations that lead to social and political manipulation and we've already been facing that right with you know our elections being manipulated things like that so that's something we need to consider and how do we need to adjust our you know the laws as well as the kind of other approaches we have to the development and the use of this tech there are also the economic impacts we're talking about. So in the next you know, several decades, there's supposed to be exponential growth of AI technology and its adoption. So we're gonna have, you know, a lot of economists believe we're gonna have job loss from uh, AI that'll significantly outpace the jobs created by AI. And our governments aren't really prepared to deal with that. They haven't really, adjusted to, well, how do we deal with that? And we're kind of actually experiencing that in a scale right now because of what's going on with the COVID pandemic, we have had a, you know, a, lot of, a large number of jobs lost in a short period of time. So this is actually a really unique opportunity where we can kind of set up some of those you know, social systems and protections we need in place to kind of address the economic impacts. So we need to consider measures such as UBI and universal healthcare, things like that, that may help people better kind of adjust it to that industrial revolution and be able to have a more smooth transition moving forward as the technology is adopted. So that's, again, something that we need to be having a discussion, you know, among ourselves and with our legislators and kind of making sure that those things get put in place and move forward. The other interesting issue with a lot of the AI that's, you know, as it's being adopted and created is the question of intellectual property. So tradition, so there's a, a different ways that intellectual property applies in this space. So there are, you know, AI platforms or services that exist right now that, you know, my clients uh, have businesses in this space. And traditional intellectual property rights apply and it's important for these companies to have in place. So it's very important to, you know, take steps to register and protect their intellectual property. It's important for them to have well-drafted agreements in place um, that protect their intellectual property in, these transa in the transactions they're engaging in. And it's important to realize it's not only the algorithms that are important, but also data sets are important when you're dealing with AI. So you need to have protections for both of those in, built into your transactions. Additionally, in addition to those kind of traditional intellectual property rights that are associated with AI technology, you additionally have a, a new kind of frontier of AI created inventions. So you have AI generated music and AI generated code and it raises the question of, well, who actually owns that intellectual property, right? The AI is not really an uh, entity that can hold AI or can hold intellectual property right now in the structure that we have set place. So how do we uh, establish that ownership and the rights for enforcement of, uh, you know, against infringement of that intellectual property? So that's something that's continuing to be developed. We recently had a, a kind of a d decision come down from the uh, USPTO that was talking about kind of, uh, you know, pat patenting some of this AI generated um product. And they actually said that, they, you know, any ownership rights are to the developer who created the AI. So that's kind of the initial development there. And I think as the AI continues to develop and gets more advanced and we have more less of a direct necessary relationship between, you know, the developer who created the AI and the generation of whatever the intellectual property is, right? We can have uh, situations as this develops where Maybe someone develops something, and then years, many years later, um, this a some AI that's arisen from that initial involvement of a person has generated something. We will have more discussions about this and more kind of 
you know, having to go in, in the US in particular, a lot of this is developed in court. So we're gonna have a lot of kind of litigation over this and have these questions for the developed in court. But um, for right now, you know, even as a, particularly as intellectual property, you know, as a business, you need to be protecting the intellectual property and trying to retain any rights to any of this. Um, AI is also be also has the potential to be used in the intellectual property space for administration of intellectual property. So basically creating a system where it's a lot easier to kind of track uh, intellectual property rights, to register, to be able to uh, protect those intellectual property rights. Uh, the complication with this is that intellectual property is really you know, on a global scale, but the laws that are applicable to it are jurisdictional, meaning that intellectual property laws are different, you know, in the US, from Europe, from Asia. So when you are having, when you're trying to get intellectual property protection on a global basis right now, you will have to kind of potentially register in multiple countries. You know, there are some trade agreements that may protect you in certain countries, but that's not global, you know, international, all countrywide, so you're going to have complications in how you can register that. And that will create complexities in being able to have like a single kind of AI generated uh, administration purpose of it. Uh, the other interesting kind of issue that arises with AI and intellectual property is that you have uh, the potential for situations to arise where there's infringement while the AI is being operated autonomously. So basically without your knowledge, it infringes in something. And, you know, examples we can kind of see of the, of this kind of issue arising already is, you know, we think about, so kind of, and this also brings in the social and ethical kind of considerations. So a couple of years ago, there was a, you know, an AI bot that micro, Microsoft put on, I think it was Twitter and within like a day and a half, given all the data that was fed to it by all the people who were interacting to it, it turned into this awful kind of uh, racist bot that was saying awful things. And they had to like take it offline because it was just creating, you know, liabilities for them. And um, it had turned into something they were not expecting. So that, that shows how, uh, you know, these AI can go into directions that are unexpected by the people who've developed them, at least right now. So it's important to kind of be uh, monitoring it and realizing that there may be these liabilities that are created, even if unintentional, on the developer's part. Uh, another kind of issue that is important and ties into the AI these days, and as we briefly mentioned earlier is the issue of data, right? So more and more data is being fed into AI algorithms and platforms, and more and more data is being generated uh, these days, right? We are all connected to, you know, smart devices. Uh, everything is, you know, IoT, Internet of Things. So there's a lot of data available, and there's real value. I mean, for all tech companies, the value is really in the data. And so when you're dealing with AI, you know, ownership of data is really important. And among that, additionally, you have to comply with data laws and privacy laws there. So, you know, you have GDPR in Europe that you have to comply with. You have CCPA, which is California, you know, similar GDPR. It's California's version has some differences. It, you know, went to effect in 2020. There's still regulations that are being finalized relating to the CCPA. There's also additional, of course, other countries have their own um, privacy laws as well. And then there's additional privacy laws that you have to apply to your transaction and your platform or algorithm, depending on the area you are dealing with. So I, you know, I have some clients that are med tech clients. So they also have to worry about high tech and HIPAA and making sure that the medical information privacy protections are also um, being applied appropriately to the data they have. So it gets more complex depending on what kind of data you're dealing with and what you're trying to do with it. So it's important to be having those discussions in order to basically build your company in a way that has value and you're not having a whole bunch of liability that's rendering the business basically uh, a source of liability and an inability to grow and get investment from a, 
a lack of value due to having this high liability. Additionally, with the you know privacy uh, kind of issue and using data in any AI company, you need to consider you know how you're using the actual data to train your algorithm and having to you know take steps to really anonymize that data. So with privacy, you know, we also have these uh, issues that arise because even though there are privacy laws that are being, you know, being passed and they're called privacy laws, it's not really a situation where you can kind of really get privacy back, right? It's more like I think they're establishing uh, rights for consumers in the data. Um, that's what I kind of see it as. So we continue to have decreasing individual privacy and any AI, these AI can analyze these data points so they can you know, look at an individual's online behavior and get uh, inferences and information about an individual's political beliefs, religious affiliation, race, ethnicity, health, gender and sexual orientation, even if they haven't ever kind of revealed that information. So it's going back to that issue that we have increasing uh, basically devices that are get, gathering data on us over multiple devices and locations. And some of the compromises we see that is, you know, people aren't quite aware that how much data is being tracked and generated on them and how much of it's being shared. So we don't really understand, like a lot of the masses don't really understand the data kind of exploitation, um, exploitation issue. We also find that, you know, people don't understand that the there is identification and tracking that's occurring through uh, these data. So AI is able to basically uh, put, you know, this data points from various devices together and locations and able to, you, you know, you can use AI to like de-anonymize personal data, even if it's been anonymized. So again, showing that privacy really is, is kind of dead, right? You have situations where people are able to still locate uh, anonymized, you know, data sources. And you have um, circumvention of legal procedures kind of coming in place with this AI. So you have now, well, you know, traditionally it's been, you can't put, you can't force someone to put their finger down and open the uh, phone by biometrics. You can, you know, with facial recognition software or voice recognition, you can just unlike unlock devices now without consent. So while there's now, a further, you know, potential ease to unlocking devices for the user. It's also created a new weak point in terms of um, some like law enforcement trying to get access to that device or border patrol or anything like that. So that's a new complexity we have to address. Um, then we have kind of like prediction software that's being created based on the data that's, you know, or again, allowing people to be potentially manipulated. We have, as we talked about, profiling issues. So we have we can have unconsented, but basically characterizing of individuals with no ability of the individual to kind of challenge that outcome. So, and that can be used in ways to access credit, employment, social services, housing. So this is kind of like, think of China's social credit system. So it's something we should, we need to be addressing by through our legislature because we do not want these kind of, you know, Unconsent, unconsented uh, characterization of people based on, uh, you know, algorithms that have biases built in and things like that. So this is what happens as we've given up, uh, you know, more, more and more privacy. We have these issue, new issues that are arising in terms of how, you know, what kind of data is accessible on us and how what decision making may be made or, uh, you know, regarding to us or how we may be potentially manipulate thinking certain things based on that data and its usage. So as I stated, data is really the most valuable resource today. Um, it continues to be monetized by companies. And I think moving forward, it'll be interesting to see how consumers get a share of that monetization. I think there will be, you know, changes there and moving forward. Um, additionally, there are liability questions related to AI. So who is responsible for losses and damages caused by AI error? Uh, traditionally, you know, as we briefly discussed before, the human operator is liable, um, but because a self-executing machine can't be liable. So there has to be some legal entity that's liable. Um, but this whole new kind of AI doing, 
you know, autonomously operating is creating ambiguity in the line of causation fault. So it creates situations where if there is some ambiguity, anyone who's potentially responsible will be called into court. So you will have to face, you will be facing the lawsuit. So there will be, you know, potentially developer software provider liability, um, manufacturer liability, smart device owner liability. An example of this is, for example, with the autonomous vehicle, uh, you know, when it may have to make a decision between, well, am I going to hit the pedestrian or save the, you know, or save the person in my vehicle? How do I make that decision? Uh, you know, there's all, there's the manufacturer potentially who's made the vehicle, the developer who's coded it and the person who owns the vehicle. So those are all kind of areas where liability can arise. And it's very interesting because as a commercial aspect, a manufacturer may not even be able to really sell a vehicle that does not prioritize the individual within the vehicle. So it may be an issue where we need legislative, you know, involvement to get a, a, a maybe a more fair versus a commercial uh, decision making process there. So it's a very interesting issue. Um, and, and as we talked about, mul multiple considerations come in play regarding profit and revenue. Uh, this is also very interesting because it creates fines and criminalization for content being spread on social media. There are some laws that have tried to be passed in the past couple years on that. And again, that brings in if you're trying to send, you know, Zuckerberg to jail for his AI not being quick enough to catch violent material, you're going to have basically private companies making decisions about free speech. So again, something we shouldn't really be in a position of allowing them to do. So we again need, um, it, you know, legislators to get involved and to regulate this in a way that makes sense. Um, additionally, as a business side, if you're a business that's engaging in a lot of this AI and, you know, new ways of doing tech, you need to, because there's ambiguity, you need to make sure your contracts have appropriate uh, liability uh, sections and provisions. So you need to very carefully draft warranties, indemnities, limitations of liability, um, and document your the AI decision making process. So at least you have evidence that you know it's all reasonable and it's as safe as human run counterparts. Um, so that is our present quick. I went through it fast since we only had a short time, but that is AI emerging tech and the law. Feel free to reach out to me on LinkedIn or email me if you have further questions or need help.